This is Breakthroughs, a podcast from Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine. I'm your host, Amanda D. Heart monitoring has come a long way since the invention of the electrocardiogram, or the EKG, in the 19th century. Today, cardiac monitoring is even more important as heart conditions like arrhythmia become increasingly common. Joining us today is Northwestern Medicine cardiac electrophysiologist, Dr. Rod Passman, who has over three decades of experience in the field. Dr. Passman pioneered the use of implantable cardiac monitors for arrhythmia and stroke patients and is now partnering with a consumer electronics company to bring wearable heart monitors to patients at lower cost. Last year, Dr. Passman was named the director of the Northwestern Center for Arrhythmia Research, which aims to discover the underlying causes of arrhythmias and improve treatment. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. So you are a cardiac electrophysiologist. To get us started, explain the connection between the heart and electricity. So uh, the heart has its own electrical system. I mean, if you think about your heartbeat, uh, the average person maybe has a heart that beats 72 times a minute. We hope for 90 plus years, and that's billions and billions of, of heartbeats over your lifetime. And what generates that heartbeat is an electrical system that tells the muscle of the heart to contract uh, at that 72 beats per minute. And when you exercise or get emotionally excited, that rate goes up. And when you're sleeping or relaxing, that rate goes down. So this electrical system serves us extremely well over our lifetime, but sometimes things go awry. In a little over a century, heart monitoring devices weighing hundreds of pounds have been improved and compressed to implantable devices and devices that we can wear comfortably on our wrists. What have been some of the most important developments in the history of cardiac monitoring? Wow. So I think that the history of medicine in general is fascinating. You know, people had described checking the pulse and monitoring pulse abnormalities sort of in the ancient Egyptian and Chinese times. It wasn't until, you know, 110 years ago uh, where scientists first began to record the electrical activity of the heart. And that opened up this whole new era of understanding uh, the normal electrical system and abnormalities in the electrical system. I would say it wasn't until the maybe 1940s or 50s that people started to work with technology where you could actually wear a monitor outside the hospital that could monitor the rhythm of the heart. And as you pointed out, those early devices weighed you know, 60, 70 pounds. You had to carry them on your back, and they can only record the rhythm of the heart for 24 hours or so. But that was an important first step. I would say another big step probably happened in the 70s when the Swedish uh, national ski team was interested in monitoring their athletes during exercise. So they designed these wearable devices that can act as a heart monitor. And then as you know, um, over the last 20 years or so, we have developed tiny heart monitors, small enough to be injected underneath the skin that could last for years and transmit data, no matter where in the world you are, back to us and give us information on your heart rhythm. And now you can go into Best Buy, right? And buy a watch or a ring uh, or any sort of sensor that could monitor your heart uh, for regular and irregular rhythms. More than 6 million Americans are living with the most common type of arrhythmia, which is sometimes being detected by these devices, as you mentioned. Arrhythmia is also known as abnormal heartbeats. Atrial fibrillation, or AFib, is the most common type of arrhythmia, and this number is expected to nearly double by 2030. Can you explain for me AFib and why it's becoming more prevalent? So as you mentioned, atrial fibrillation is the most common abnormal rhythm that we see in adults. And that 6 million number that people quote is probably an underestimate because there are people walking around with this problem that don't know they have it. So atrial fibrillation is a very rapid chaotic rhythm that forms in the upper portion of the heart. And the lower portion of the heart that generates the pulse can also go rapid, but is often irregular. And atrial fibrillation can have big consequences. Sometimes people don't feel well. They may feel winded or may feel palpitations or lightheaded. What's interesting is that many patients feel nothing. The big concern with atrial fibrillation is that it increases your risk of stroke by about 500%. The risk, of course, is that if you know you have it, we can get you on a blood thinner and reduce that risk. But for many patients, the stroke may be the first manifestation of the abnormal rhythm. So monitoring people for atrial fibrillation, particularly those that don't know they have AFib, can have some important consequences, we think. 
And in a study in circulation, you to detect fibrillation in stroke patients, you used implantable cardiac monitors. What did you find when you had this ongoing surveillance? Well, so that was a, a study that was looking at an entity called cryptogenic stroke, meaning people had a stroke and we can't figure out what the cause of the stroke was despite very extensive and often expensive evaluation. Well, as I mentioned, atrial fibrillation can be silent. What I didn't mention is that atrial fibrillation could come and go. So you may have it you know, on Monday and not have it on Wednesday. And if I checked your pulse or did an EKG on Monday, I might not pick up your atrial fibrillation. So in this study, what we did is we implanted these loop recorders, these monitors underneath the skin that could continually record the rhythm of the heart over a several year period. And what we found was that in about a third of the patients, they had abnormal rhythms that we otherwise wouldn't have found. So this is important because if you've had a stroke, um, you get put on drugs like aspirin. If you've had a stroke and are then found to have atrial fibrillation, well, aspirin is not enough in that situation, and you really need to be on a blood thinner. So this has really changed the way we evaluate these patients. And what are some of the side effects or complications from blood thinners as treatment? So uh, blood thinners are fantastic in reducing blood clot formation and reducing the risk of stroke in patients with atrial fibrillation, but because they're blood thinners, they also promote bleeding. So we're always balancing the risks and the benefits of any medication, particularly here where strokes are devastating, but bleeds can also be quite serious. And last year, you discovered that implantable cardiac monitors could reduce patients' time on blood thinners by 95%. This is an exciting finding, though there are barriers to implementing this technology in the clinic. Tell me how this finding led to further studies. Well, so I think that what we're trying to do is, is truly a paradigm shift. Right now, if you have a history of atrial fibrillation and you have other stroke risk factors like high blood pressure, diabetes, or your advanced age, you're on a blood thinner for the rest of your life. Some people are in atrial fibrillation every single day, and that might be justified. There are some people who have one episode of AFib a year, or there are some people who have been put on medications or had a procedure like an ablation and don't have AFib anymore. Yet all of those patients are treated in the exact same manner with a lifetime of a blood thinner. Why? Well, because if you don't know you're having AFib, how are we going to know if you're having AFib, number one? Number two is, um, historically, we had no way of monitoring you over very long periods of time. And number three is, up until a few years ago, the only blood thinner we had, a drug called Coumadin, would take four or five days to take effect. Over the last decade, we now have blood thinners that will thin the blood in an hour or two. So you can imagine this paradigm shift where in patients who only have rare episodes of AFib or because they've had a procedure or on medication have no episodes at all, maybe they could stop their blood thinner and take it only in response to a prolonged episode of AFib. When we first started looking into this project, the only way that we can reliably monitor patients remotely over a long period of time was with one of these implantable monitors. And the good news is that these devices will continually record the rhythm of the heart. But these devices are invasive, they're expensive, and the data comes to me as your doctor, not to you. So if you have an episode of atrial fibrillation on Friday night, well, I may not know about it until Monday morning, which might be too long. In between the time that we began to look at this, of course, now a generation of wearable devices has come onto the market. So you may be familiar with devices like the Apple Watch, which actually checks the pulse throughout the day and could tell you whether you're having atrial fibrillation. So our next study will ask the question, can we use a relatively inexpensive wearable device to alert the person when they're in atrial fibrillation and have them take their blood thinner for only a short period of time, deriving the benefits from the drugs without risking the bleed risk over a long period of time when they may not need it? This type of partnership or collaboration to detect and treat arrhythmia and other heart conditions is kind of the reason that the Center for Arrhythmia Research started at Northwestern, which you've been leading now for more than a year and a half. What has been most exciting for you during your time as director? Well, I think, first of all, I'm really excited to be leading this effort because um, at a university like Northwestern, we have amazing depth and breadth of, of expertise throughout the campus. And many people may be working on technologies or issues that may at first seem tangential to heart rhythm disorders, but actually play a big role. So the center allows us to sort of bring these people out of their silos under one sort of virtual umbrella. 
So we work with people in imaging and genetics and biomedical engineering and preventive health, all of those things to sort of combine our efforts. So far, it's been really exciting. You know, we've gotten a chance to uh, partner with industry to design wearable devices that are better suited for this need. We have uh, worked with biomedical engineering to design things like dissolvable pacemakers, and we continue to work with our colleagues in imaging to look at new imaging techniques, a, an area called four-dimensional flow, where we could actually see blood flow in the heart in real time to try to tease out why some people with atrial fibrillation are at higher risk of stroke than others. It sounds like the center is already looking ahead into the future of the field of cardiac monitoring and treatment, but is there anything else that you hope the future will bring? Yeah. I mean, I think that there are many unknown aspects of atrial fibrillation, right? The procedures that we do have modest success rates. They are quite invasive and expensive. And right now, it's kind of one size fits all. We don't know how to treat an individual who may be different, right? We have a limited number of treatment options um, when it comes to controlling the rhythm of the heart and when it comes to reducing the risk of stroke. And I think that we need to personalize care and we need to understand the genetics and the anatomy and how likely one is to be, respond to a particular therapy so that we can really customize care. And when it comes to stroke prevention, the work that we're doing, that's the goal here, right? It's not one size fits all. It doesn't make sense that all patients get treated with the same lifetime uh, risky medication when some people may not need it for long stretches of time. Right now, we think of monitoring in terms of you know wearable devices or implantable devices, but there's all sorts of interesting things out there. You know, so there's the ability using sort of a video camera, right, to see minute changes in the coloring of your skin during each heartbeat, which can pick out who has an abnormal rhythm and who doesn't just by filming a group of people. There are sensors that could be embedded in your mattress, in your car, that can sense uh, movements in the heart and that can discern whether or not you're having an abnormal rhythm. There are speakers that could send out little sonar impulses and collect the data that comes off your chest to determine whether you're having an, an abnormal rhythm or not. So what I think is that the, the paradigm where you would go to the doctor's office and the doctor would examine you and tell you if something's wrong, that's going to change, right? We're going to be monitoring you, of course, with your permission if you want to throughout your day, whether it be with a wearable device or when you look at your smartphone or when you sit at your desk. If we really want to monitor you for abnormal rhythms and we want to personalize your care, those are the kind of technologies that you're going to be seeing in the not too distant future. This technology sounds incredible. And for the students and trainees who might be implementing this technology one day, what advice would you offer them? Well, you know, I think that all good breakthroughs in medicine happen because there's a clinical question that is unanswered. So I think that, you know, all of the things that I do have come out of my care for patients, seeing where the limitations are in the current strategies and, and understanding how we can make that better. So if you're a physician, I would say keep your eyes open, listen to people, because they will tell you where the gaps in knowledge are. And then, you know, to be in a great place like Northwestern, where you can tap into resources and people interested, I think is great as well. So if you're not a physician who can listen to patients, uh, I would urge you to get out of your comfort zone and explore where your area of interest can apply to improving the lives of, of people. Thank you for listening to Breakthroughs. If you like the show, find us on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts to rate and review us and find past episodes. 